Morning, everybody, and thanks for tuning into our virtual service here at DVCC. If we haven't met, my name is Dave Schellenbarker, and I'm here to bring you the communion meditation this morning. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by sharing a ver- several verses from Jeremiah chapter 31. These will be 31 through 34, and I'll be reading from the ESV. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. As we gather around the communion table and reflect on these verses, there's a whole lot there to remember, but I want to give you three things that stand out to me from these verses. First of all, God made the covenant that entitles us to be here. We don't have any right to do this on our own. Secondly, God's covenant is written on our hearts, and it's available to all. Thirdly, God has forgiven our sins and remembers them no more. So before we partake, I'd like you to think about three other things, three specific things to to kind of put your mind in the right frame as we partake of our communion today. First of all, are we coming to the table in a humble manner, recognizing that we don't deserve to be here? Secondly, do we recognize that our relationship to God has come at a great cost, the cost of our Savior, Jesus Christ, his life on the, and death on the cross. Thirdly, do we truly acknowledge our sins, and have we asked God to forgive us and help us to avoid repeating our sins? I'd like you to think about these things before you partake of the emblems, emblems today, and I want to remind you again that as we're at home, uh, you can use anything that you happen to have handy. Water or juice is fine. You can use a saltine or a Ritz crack or anything that you happen to have in, in the house. But just use these to help you remember and remind you of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I'd like you to uh, bow your heads and pray with me now. 
Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that our Lord has made for us. We thank you for reminding us again and again that you are the one that brings us to this table. We don't come here uh, on our own. We're invited to this table by you. We thank you for the covenant that you have written on our hearts. We thank you for the fact that you've made it available to all and ask you to help us to help others to see that as well. And Father, most importantly, we thank you for forgiving our sins and the fact that you remember them no more. What a comfort this is to us, Lord. We thank you so much for the many blessings you've given us and ask you to bless us now as we partake of these emblems together. In Jesus' name, amen. For our offertory meditation today, I'd like to share a quote with you. This particular quote comes from Mother Teresa. She once said, if you give what you do not need, it isn't giving. So today, as we think about the time of offering, we can thank God that Jesus decided to give up everything that he had to come to earth and to sacrifice his life for us. Let us consider our giving based on these blessings. Now, we recognize that many of you might not be in a position to give financially right now, and that's fine. We certainly understand that. And if you're a virtual visitor to our online service, welcome. We just are so pleased that you're here. Please don't feel obligated to give. But for any who do want to give, remember that there are two ways that you can do it right now. The first is to go to our website at www.visitdvcc.org, and you can contribute securely there. Or you can mail a check to the church, and the address for the church is below me here on the screen. Thank you all for attending us with us today. Let's turn our thoughts to God and, and thank Him for the blessings we've been given. Father, we do thank you so much for all of the blessings that we have. And we ask you to help us to remember that they are not ours to give. They are already yours. We are just here to, to take good care of them for a few years while we're here on earth. So please, Lord, help us to be willing to give up some of them to help others to further your kingdom in this place. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, DVCC family. It's Pastor Scott here. Just wanted to take a moment and provide a little bit of an update and an important opportunity for those that would like to serve in an important way. Uh, as you know, we've been having outdoor services through the month of September. Uh, we've completed those. Those were great opportunities for those who could come to gather together and uh, at least see one another and have the opportunity to worship together outside. Now that the weather has gotten uh, cooler, uh, we uh, have completed those. And as we've been mentioning, we are working on a plan for the possibility of an indoor service. Haven't set a date yet because... One of the reasons is we really want to make sure that we have the team of volunteers needed to be able to do that, that well. And so we've been mentioning that. Some of you have expressed interest in that. So what I want to say today is if you're interested in considering volunteering uh, for helping in this indoor service, then you can go to our website at www.visitdbcc.org and you go to the Get Involved um, tab. Our, our link, and there you will find a description of this volunteer opportunity and also uh, a form that you can fill out if you are interested. And uh, that basically the way of looking at it would be sort of like an usher or a guide during the service. And the more we ha people that we have that are interested in that and can be trained for that, uh, then the, the easier it will be for us to be able to have a safe and healthy service. And that's our goal. Um, I do want to remind you that we are going to continue to have our online services right through uh, this period of time. So there will always be that opportunity for those uh, that are going to be joining us online for any, any particular reason. Uh, and we will continue that. Um, so I would encourage you, if, if you're at all interested, to check that out um, in volunteering. Perhaps you've served as a, a greeter or as uh, at the welcome desk in the past or you know, the more people we have, then the bigger uh, rotation we can have, less times people would have to serve. And of course, we all need to keep our eye on what is happening in terms of the virus in our community. And so, you know, we're setting these goals prayerfully, seeking to do what is, uh, is following the appropriate guidelines and provide the opportunities that we can. So I would encourage you to uh, keep 
Uh, each, let's keep each other in prayer. Uh, let's uh, continue to focus in our own personal relationship on the Lord. Find ways to encourage each other during these times. And again, um, prayerfully consider volunteering uh, for this opportunity. And I hope you have a great day, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham, and first of all, I just want to say thank you for uh, your support of Operation Christmas Child. This is an incredible opportunity to reach children uh, around the world, and especially with 2020, uh, COVID-19. This is the first time in the history of the world where the world has been locked down. It's never happened before. It just makes me think that maybe the Lord Jesus Christ will be coming back soon. And if that's the case, we need to be working even harder now than ever. And we need your help. We need your prayers. We need your support as we reach out around the world in Jesus' name, helping children by giving them a gift, discipling them for those that receive Christ, discipling them in God's Word so that they can go out and reach their friends and their family with the truth of the gospel. Multiplication. So thank you for your help. Thank you for your support, your prayers. We got a lot of work in front of us. God bless you. Good to be with you this morning, and uh, as we continue our series that we've been doing as our fall kickoff uh, in the theme, hashtag whatever, and uh, our theme verse, Philippians 1.27, uh, Paul exhorts us as followers of Christ that whatever happens, he says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And so we've been looking at that uh, theme of hashtag whatever, whatever comes, whatever happens. And last week we looked at whatever things are, are true, uh, to focus our minds on that. And, and the whole idea of this theme for this fall kickoff of our ministry year and as our, our, as our, our ministry as a body of Christ and, and as we go into this very challenging or continue to go through this very challenging season we're in is to focus on these themes in the book of Philippians to help us as followers of Christ, whatever, whatever we're experiencing. And we know that uh, we have a lot of challenges, and this week in particular, we have a number of more challenges, as we found out that our president uh, has contracted the uh, COVID virus, and we have an election coming up, and all kinds of other challenges. And so what I'd like to do this morning is just open us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to open God's word and see what um, God has to say to us this morning. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your grace and your mercy, and we do thank you that we can trust you in whatever happens, whatever comes. You've told us in your word uh, that we are to pray, Lord, for our, our government, for our leaders, both our local and state and federal leaders of, at all levels. And Lord, we are going through a difficult and challenging time right now as a country, uh, we pray that as your people, that we would seek your face, uh, that we would seek wisdom as we exercise our privilege and our freedom and our right as citizens to vote. Uh, we pray for your guidance and direction. We do pray uh, for our president and for his wife at this time as they um, go through this uh, period of time with the virus. We lift their health up to you. We lift up our leaders as they work to make decisions uh, at the federal level. And Father, we thank you that as your people, uh, as those who know you through your son Jesus, we can trust you. And we pray, Father, that you would speak to us through your word this morning. 
In Jesus' name, amen. And as I said, we are in the, uh, in the book of, of Philippians, and this morning we're going to be in Philippians 4, 8, and 9. And our focus will be in particular on verse 9. So I'll be reading uh, from the English Standard Version, Philippians 4, 8, and 9. You can follow along on the screen, or if you prefer, you can read um, on your device or your Bible at home. Paul says in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And then our focus this morning is in verse 9. Whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. As I was preparing the uh, sermon this week and looking at the theme that Paul has in this uh, passage of scripture of practicing the things that people have seen in him, I was remembering a, a very powerful event in my life when my daughter, uh, Kara, was a teenager uh, going to school. And one time I, I picked her up, as parents do, you know, basically we were the, you know, the shuttle service, the taxi service for our kids, our three kids, as uh, many of you uh, know and relate to, you know, picking them up for this activity, taking them to this activity. And our, our kids, uh, so I, I picked them up, I picked her up one day, and you know, it was a long day, it was, it was tired, it was the end of the day, and when we got in the car and she was uh, riding along with me, she, she told me that they had an assignment in school, and one of the assignments, my kids went to a Christian school, one of the assignments was for them to draw a picture of someone who reminded them of Jesus, in the way that they acted, or something along those lines, and so she, she showed me that the picture that she had drawn was a picture of me driving our car. <laughs> and she said, you know, Dad, I just feel like, you know, you have to come pick me up and you take me places and I always need you to, um, to take me around. And I just feel like the way you act and the way you treat me reminds me of how uh, Jesus uh, would treat me um, because you're patient and all of those types of things. Now, you know, for any of you that are parents, I mean, you can imagine it. I've never forgotten that moment. I can remember it like it was yesterday, you know, it was many years ago, where I was on the road and, and, and that particular event. And, you know, I don't share that story to say, oh, you know, I was this great, you know, model, spiritual giant. And I hesitate to even share it because that's not the point of the story. But the point of the story is, it made a deep impression on me because a couple of things. One, because I know internally how many times I felt I felt anything, but like I was like Jesus, because a lot of times on the inside I was tired and I didn't really feel like having to do it. Um, but I did ask for God's help and His grace to treat my kids with grace and mercy and patience. It also really spoke to me about the impact that something even as small as that can have. On, in this case, my daughter, but just on people around us, that something like that really made a difference in her life. And, it, and, it, and, it, and of course, it made, gave me a lot of gratitude, and it also humbled me, but it also encouraged me that even that act of, you know, patiently picking her up, of asking her how her day was, of all those kinds of things, caused my child to say, you know, I see Jesus in my dad. And I'm sure that if you could interview my daughter and ask her, did, were there times when you didn't see Jesus in your dad? Oh, if she's being honest, she would say, absolutely, there were times I didn't see Jesus in my dad. Um, but I believe that the overall picture that by the grace of God, my kids got was that they were able to see Jesus in me. And that's really the nature of the Christian faith is that the nature of the Christian faith is that it's, we use this big word, an incarnational faith. What does that mean? It means that, that it, it, we are followers of Jesus, who is the Son of God, who became a man, who became, came from heaven and became a man. God put on human flesh. So 
His disciples could hear him, hear his teaching. They could see him. They could observe him. They could literally touch him. They could sit with him, eat with him, ask him questions. In short, they did life with him. They did life with him. That's how he showed them who God was. That's how he showed them what faith is. He lived it out before them, and they could see it because he became a man. In this very same book of Philippians, in chapter 2, and verses 5 to 7, there are some famous verses about that. Notice in chapter 2, verse 5, it says, have, Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, notice, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. So it's saying that, it's, it's describing this, this reality that, that God the Son came down to earth and he was born as a human being and he lived out a fully human life. And of course, we know that Paul goes on to talk about and that he has suffered and he was obedient in his humanity to the Father, even to the point of going to the cross. And so this ministry of Jesus, this incarnational ministry, this living out in life before his disciples type of, of discipleship is the pattern that Jesus sets for his followers as well. It's the pattern that he sets for us as well in leading people to faith in Christ, in leading people to understand who Jesus is, in allowing them to know him and to grow in him. It involves this life-on-life -life experiential learning from those who are following Jesus. So we can say, in a certain sense, we follow Jesus and people can follow us. We follow Jesus and people can follow us. Now Paul, the Apostle, says this most clearly in the New Testament, I believe, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, where Paul writes to the Corinthians, notice, Be imitators of me. Be imitators of me as I am of who? As I am of Christ. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. It's powerful, isn't it? Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so the theme I'd like us to think about this morning is this. We can say to people, whatever you see of Jesus in me, whatever you see of Jesus in me, follow. Whatever you see of Jesus in me, follow. Now, in the ultimate sense, in the ultimate sense, we say, follow Jesus. We, we, ha we, we have to know that. We are not Jesus. Newsflash. We say, follow Jesus. That's where we're pointing people. It's like the author who wrote a, wrote a book, um, Christian author wrote a book, and in the foreword, and I'll, I'll never forget this forward. he said, everything good in this book comes from Jesus. Only the mistakes are mine. Only the mistakes are mine. And so we recognize that ultimately, all ultimately good comes from Jesus. But Paul himself, who said, imitate me, knew he was not perfect. So it's not about perfection, or else Paul couldn't have said that. So how do we know, you say, how do you know that Paul didn't think he was perfect, or that he had arrived? Well, let me show you. Philippians chapter 3 Verses 12 to 16, start in verse 12. In the same book of Philippians, Paul says this, Not that I have already obtained this, spiritual perfection or maturity, or I'm already, notice, perfect, complete, full, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything, if anything you think otherwise, or any or if anything I should say you think otherwise, 
God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Now notice verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me. Brothers, join in imitating me. So Paul is saying, look, I'm, I'm on the journey too. I'm pursuing Christ. I have not yet arrived. So what's he saying? Imitating me. Imitate my pursuit of Christ. Imitate anything good you see in me as I pursue Christ. Imitate that. Let that be a pattern. Let that be an example for you. That's what Paul is saying. And so Paul comes toward the end of his letter to the Philippians, as we are here in chapter 4, and he calls the Philippians, and at that time, and by extension us, to this type of action as they seek to live in union with Christ. He calls them to this type of action of, of, of following Paul as he follows Christ, but then ultimately by extension and by implication, those who follow them can also follow Christ. Notice again in verse 9 of chapter 4, Whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, practice these things, notice, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. When Paul refers to things that they have learned and received from Paul, this of course would involve the teaching that Paul has given to them, including what is written in this epistle. Uh, it's part of his teaching to them. And we've already seen, for example, that he said to them that, that they need to live worthy of the gospel, whatever happens. They need to walk in love and unity based on the humility that they've seen in Christ. They are, as we've seen, to consider all their pedigree, spiritual accomplishments, whatever it is they think they can offer to God as their credentials in a sense. Um, they have to consider them as loss for the sake of knowing the ultimate prize, which is Jesus Christ through faith, that nothing compares to faith in Christ. Uh, we've seen that they are to seek to know Christ and his resurrection power. We just saw that in chapter 3, to pursue Christ. And also they are to focus all of their anxieties in prayer to God and lay them all at his feet and receive his his peace. And then last week we saw that they are to look for that which is true and noble and pure in God and in, in others and in the world. Um, so those are the things that they've learned and received. And that's very much a Hebrew way of thinking about when there's something, te something taught, it's taught and then it's also taken in and received. And that's the idea. Also he says what you've heard and this would probably be what they know about Paul from others. Uh, accounts about Paul's life and ministry that they may have heard through, through Timothy. Um, and also, he says, what you have seen in me. And that could be what they have observed directly by watching Paul when they were around him. But even for those that maybe hadn't been around him physically, uh, he shares very personal uh, the stories in his in this in this letter to the Philippians, he talks very much about his imprisonment and how he's handled that. He talks about his 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 life being that to for me to live, he says, is Christ. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He talks about how his greatest aspiration was that Christ would be glorified in his life and in his body. So I think it can include all of those things that they've both seen physically with their eyes, but also that they've seen by his testimony about his life. Paul is talking about whatever they know about Paul in his speech, in his actions, in his attitudes, in his teaching. It's his life. Whatever they can draw out of Paul's life that reflects Christ, he's saying, practice that. Practice that. And so that does lead us to what are, what are they to do with these things that they take note of, that they've taken in from Paul. Notice again in verse 9, whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, notice, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Practice them. Yes, Sixers fans, we're talking about practice. And if you don't get that, that's okay, move on. But what's practice? Well, practice is to put something into your life. To see it, hear it, and then say, now let me do this. 
you know, when you're learning how to do something, someone shows you how to do something and then you say, okay, here's how you do this, now you do it. When you're learning a new job, somebody says, here's how you do this, now let me see you do it. That's practice. That's saying Paul's focus on Christ, Paul's perspective on, on his life in Christ, Paul's humility, all these different things that you have seen in me, practice those things. Put those things into your life. And as again, our theme says, whatever you see of Jesus in me, Paul is saying, follow. Whatever you see of Jesus in me, whatever you see of Jesus in me, follow. And we know that Paul was no, what we call, ivory tower theologian, separate from those he preached to. We know that he was in prison when he wrote these things to them. He was suffering greatly. So he wasn't, you know, calling on them to do something he himself wouldn't do. He was giving them an apprenticeship in life. How he approach each and every situation of life. What difference does Christ make in those moments is what Paul's talking about. And in that sense, there are really no real small moments in our lives. Just like driving your child around is no, to me it might be a small moment. It's no small moment to that child who's watching you. And so the point that we want to take away from this, brothers and sisters, is that our lives have an impact on others. What we do, what we teach, and what we say. Modeling. We call that modeling. So there is a sense in which we can certainly say, don't follow me, follow Jesus. As I said earlier, in the ultimate sense, yes, we want people not to be followers of us. We want them to be followers of Jesus. But there is a sense in which we could say, follow me as I follow Jesus. You see the difference? When you see me following Jesus, I want to be someone that you can um, follow as well. Perfection is not attainable in this life as the goal. And we saw that Paul was not perfect, but faithfulness and consistency is attainable with God's grace. Think of it this way. I like to think of it this way. We can be a North Star for someone else. You know, a North Star is a place you can, can look to try to get your bearings. We can be a North Star for someone else. We can be someone that someone looks at and says, you know, I want to aspire to follow Christ the way that person follows Christ. People aren't looking for perfection. They know we're not perfect. In fact, part of following Christ is admitting we're not perfect. Part of following Christ is saying, I'm sorry. Part of following Christ is asking for forgiveness. I had to learn that as a father. You know, when I would um, be impatient with my kids or, or say something that was not kind to my kids, um, get frustrated or angry, I would think, oh, I can't, you know, I, I can't go and apologize to them because... You know, it's going to upset the whole balance of, of power and authority here. And, and they're going to, whatever, you know, all the stuff that goes on in your head. But then the Lord would speak to me and realize, well, hold it. I mean, if, if you said something that hurt their feelings, you, you need to go apologize. Ask them for forgiveness. That's what God calls you to do. And, you know, I'd love to tell you it was easy to do that. It wasn't because of pride in me. But when I went to my kids, I said, you know, i got to tell you, I'm I'm sorry. Please forgive me for speaking to you that way. Please forgive me for losing my temper. Please forgive me for whatever. It brought us closer together. Because what do they need to see? They need to see Christ's life lived out. We all mess up. We all fail. The question is, what do we do with that? The gospel says there's forgiveness. There's reconciliation. So that's also following Christ. We can be a north star for someone. We can be a light. A light reflecting the light of Jesus. You know, the moon doesn't have its own light. Spoiler alert, if you didn't know that, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that, but the moon does not have its own light. It reflects the light of the sun. What a beautiful image. We reflect the light of the sun. We're not the light, but we can reflect his light to others and illumine others' lives about who Christ is. And so I want to speak to parents directly for just a moment. Parents, never diminish the role that you have in your children's life just by following Christ, just by letting them see what it looks like to follow Jesus. It doesn't mean you have to sit down and read the Bible to them every day. It doesn't mean you have to be a theologian and, and understand the depths of theology and you know whatever you think of in your mind. It, it, it's really just living out the life of Christ in front of them, 
day by day and the decisions you make, how you talk to them, how you treat other people, what they see in you is so powerful. And that's true for grandparents and aunts and uncles. And, and even if you're not married, don't have children or whatever, it, 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 whoever is in your sphere of influence, your coworkers, your colleagues, your, they're all watching. Believe me, they're watching. They're watching. If you, they know that you claim to follow Christ, they're watching to see what, what that looks like. And you can be uh, a light of Christ in their lives. Whatever your, influ- whatever your sphere, don't denigrate your influence. And the most powerful impact that we can have is when our words and our actions cohere. When our words and our actions come together. That's the most powerful. In other words, when what we say and what we do come together. If we, if I, if we, have, if we live a life where we say this and we do this, it, it, it undermines all of that that we're trying to do in helping people come to know who Christ is. So if I teach that truth is important, or I say that truth is important, but I lie no impact, or really it's a negative impact. I say that we should treat people with respect and kindness, but we berate people to their face or behind their back. No impact. I say trusting God is essential and following his word is the path to follow, but when under pressure I continually do what I want, even if it's not what God says, that's not setting the pattern that we want people to follow. The saying is, the old saying is, more is caught than taught, and that's really true. More is taken in through example and modeling than anything else. So our goal is to have our words and our actions cohere. That's the sweet spot right there, when our words and our actions cohere. When we say, you know, it's important that we follow Christ in each area of our lives, and we do that. When we say it's important how we respond to the Word of God in our daily lives, and we do that. That's where the sweet spot is. So do people see that Christ is central in your life and how you treat others and your decision-making for your priorities and your goals, how you choose what you will do? Do people see that, the people around you, closest to you? I love Philippians 2, 14 to 16. And Paul reminds us there, about our role as the people of God. He says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom, notice, you shine as lights in the world. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. That's the point. Paul says we can shine as lights collectively, individually, but then collectively as lights in the world. And then Paul ends in the latter part of Philippians 4 9. He says, Whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, notice, and the God of peace will be with you. And that's plural with you. So we could say the God of peace will be with you all. Well, what does that mean? Well, if as a community of believers, we're all seeking to put into practice, what Paul is putting into practice in his life, then how can we not have the peace of God prevail in our community? That's what Paul is saying. That's how we stay unified. That's how we stay at peace with one another as we each of us seeks to practice the things that lead us toward following Jesus. And so remember our theme, whatever you see of Jesus in me, follow. And that would be the prayer I would have for all of us today, that we would be able to say to others, whatever you see of Jesus in me, follow. So let me ask you, whose life are you impacting through your example? Whose life are you impacting through your example? And how are you impacting it? Because positive or negative, you are impacting it. Positive or negative, you are showing people at least a picture of what it means to follow Christ. And can you say to these people, whatever you see of Jesus in me, follow. And again, we can only do these things through the grace of God, through his power. And if you're watching today and you have not yet placed your faith in Christ, if you've not yet come to that place where you've said, look, I know I need you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I know I can't save myself. Then let me say to you today, make this the day. Just where you are right in watching this in your home, just just pray to, pray, pray to God. Just talk to God and say, God, I know I'm a sinner, God. I know I need you life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And then let us know that you did that. Send us a, send us a note or somehow send, write, write to us at info at 
visit dvcc.org and we'd love to follow up with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we can be those who set an example, who are, can be a North Star for someone else to follow you. And we pray that you would give us the grace and the strength to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for being with us and have a great day.